So everyone believes in academic freedom, yeah, just as everyone believes in democracy. The devil is in the detail. What do we mean by academic freedom? And in the debates that Dennis and I and others have been having over the last few years, two distinct views or families of views have emerged, which we could call the individualist and the institutionalist. Um, the individualists view academic freedom primarily as a right of individual academics and students too to voice their opinion without fear of repercussion. Um, and corollary to this, there's uh, an obligation on universities to maintain neutrality, right? Um, because if the university as an institution comes out strongly in favour of one side of a debate, it's very difficult for individual academics and students in that university to come out in favour of the other side. Yeah? Um, the alternative view, the institutionalist view, sees academic freedom really as the freedom of institutions to set their own agenda without interference from government. Um, yeah. uh, so, two very different views. Um, now, I'm basically uh, uh, on the individualist side of this debate. I think academic freedom is fundamentally a right of individuals to speak freely. Um, now, I, I very much believe in institutional autonomy as well. I think it's, it's important that universities you know, shouldn't just become organs of government. They should have autonomy. Um, but I do think that, that autonomy is very much constrained by the, the, the fundamental autonomy or, or freedom of individuals within the universities to speak freely, yeah, which must not be overridden by the institution. Um, so fundamentally, academic freedom is a is the freedom of individuals, and only in a secondary sense of institutions. The, the institutional view um, has two main strands. Um, there are those who appeal to the uh, freedom of academic disciplines to set their own standards without interference, and there are those who appeal to the freedom of universities as institutions to take positions. Um, let me take those in turn. So first of all, the, 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 the disciplinary autonomy view. So this is, um, uh, um, uh, has, a, has a powerful advocate in the current Chichley uh, Professor of Political Philosophy, uh, Amir Srinivasan, who's argued for it on a number of occasions um, in the LRB and elsewhere. So Srinivasan's view is that there, we have to draw a fundamental distinction between free speech and academic freedom. Yeah? So free speech is the freedom that we all as citizens enjoy to speak freely you know, within the law on any subject. Yeah? Academic freedom is a much more restrictive notion. Yeah? So it's restricted not just by you know, the, the general laws governing speech, but by the specific purpose of the academic enterprise, which is to arrive at truth, yeah? Um, and this puts restraints on, on academics. So, for example, um, uh, you know, um, a Holocaust denier like David Irving is, is free um, under the law of the land to um, promote his views, yeah? But he's not owed a platform by any university. Universities will be quite within their rights to not to invite him to conferences, not to publish his books, and so forth. Because he's an unsound historian, yeah? He's violated the canons of the historical discipline, yeah? Um, he you know, fabricates evidence, and so forth, yeah? Um, so, so, um, so, yes, he's, so he enjoys free speech, but uh, he doesn't enjoy the right to promote his views in, in an academic context. Um, now, I think that's, that's all fair enough, um, and I agree with that. The trouble is that in recent years, um, a lot of academics have been censored by their colleagues, by other people in their disciplines, um, uh, for saying things that are, are not actually, um, that don't actually violate the canons of those disciplines, but are just politically controversial, right? Um, um, and these criticisms are presented as though they were, you know, um, based on academic standards, but in fact they're political, yeah? So a lot of political censorship 
um, you know, sails under the cover of maintaining disciplinary standards. For example, um, um, Nigel Bigger, the Oxford historian, uh, was criticised by, um, sorry, he's a theologian, not a historian, he was criticised by a lot of Oxford historians uh, for um, you know, doing bad history, um, but their real objection was, a, was an ethical and political one. It was that they disagreed with his views on the British Empire. Yeah? Uh, so it was presented as a, you know, a point about historical standards. Actually, it was a political point. Um, and um, uh, I mean, there, there are many other examples of this sort of thing. So, so yes, I mean, I, I would accept uh, Srinivasan's point that disciplines, you know, should be um, able to um, police themselves and um, maintain standards gatekeeping, but this must not become a cover for political censorship, and it's often become that in recent uh, years. Okay, so that's, um, that's the appeal to disciplines. Now, there's another strand of the institutionalist um, argument which appeals to the autonomy of universities as institutions. Um, the idea is that uh, universities should be able to take collective um, positions on certain controversial issues, um, uh, and they shouldn't be prevented from doing that by, by central government. That's part of their, their freedom as institutions. Um, I, I don't agree with this, actually. I think, I mean, there are some exceptions. Explicitly religious foundations should be able to promote their own particular religious positions. I think Oxford colleges, Cambridge colleges, as Anglican foundations, should be able to you know, say graces before meals and employ an Anglican chaplain. Okay, that's largely ceremonial. Um, but um, for the bulk of UK universities, which are, which are secular institutions, I, I do think they should commit themselves to something like the Kelvin Principles. Um, why? Um, well, I think there are two reasons. One has to do with um, what's been called the telos of the university as an institution, which is to pursue the truth um, without any preconceptions. Um, we can't say in advance that we know what the truth is or that we know the whole truth on any issue. It has to remain an open question. Therefore, the university has to be a, a neutral forum. Right? It can't constrain practitioners. Um, and the second has to do with public accountability. So uh, universities in the UK are at least quasi-public institutions, they receive a lot of government support. Um, it's very important that they don't take sides in the big political debates of the day. Because if they do that, um, you know, taxpayers are going to ask quite reasonably, why are we subsidising these institutions? Yeah? Um, and it's, uh, it's going to massively discredit science and intellectual enterprise more generally if it's seen as taking sides in political disputes rather than simply being a forum within which all the, the main views in society can be freely discussed. Um, so, yes, um, I think I've... Have I run out of time? Uh, yes, OK. Uh, so, yes, so academic freedom, yes, but fundamentally academic freedom is a right of individuals, not a right of institutions. Hi. Uh, well, I think I agree with a lot of that. Um, uh, obviously, there's a lot of uh, tendencies within universities today to increase diversity and inclusion and make these into policies, and they're regularly called upon to combat unacceptable views uh, and uh, you know, driving them out rather than necessarily combating them, countering them. Uh, or challenging them, uh, and, and I think that that happens in universities even if there's very little evidence uh, that those views are particularly prevalent. It's almost uh, a, a mantra these days. I got one example, uh, as Dennis says, I teach architecture. Um, the Bartlett School of Architecture, where I studied but don't teach, um, a few years ago there was one student who found evidence that uh, some students were being bullied. I won't go into the details, I, I've written about it elsewhere, but uh, the evidence was pretty thin on the ground. The accusers uh, were few and far between, but still the head of the department was sacked. Uh, eight members of staff were let go, and, uh, and of course on social media, every tutor that you've ever hated was uh, named and shamed as being part of the problem. 
uh, the wider problem. Um, and my point that derives from that is that then the following week, all architecture schools then had these uh, internal uh, meetings to discuss uh, whether we also had a culture of bullying in our departments. And when I said that there wasn't any, uh, I was told that obviously I needed to look harder uh, because we were obviously in, in denial. And it's, it's out there if you want to find it. So I think similarly you have all these institutions like um, Athena Swan and um, uh, Stonewall and critical race activists, etc., who are all there to help us uh, stop voicing the wrong opinions, even if there's very little evidence uh, that it goes on and, and whatever that kind of um, uh, uh, wrong opinion might mean to different people. But at least, um, even though that's an unstoppable industry, and I'm sure we might want to talk about some of these organisations that have found their way into universities, at least there's a considerable concern about it, there's a lot of discussion about it. But I think there's one ideology, if I might uh, be so bold, uh, to say that uh, it exists within universities that generates very little concern, uh, and it's kind of compels speech that uh, no one seems bothered about being compelled to say. And it's called sustainability, uh, or sometimes called environmentalism, or it's taught as the climate crisis. Um, and in 2019, so just five years ago, Bristol University was the first university in the UK to declare a climate emergency, uh, whatever that is. But by 2021, 169 universities, that's all of them, uh, had declared uh, the same thing. And coincidentally, by 2021, the NUS recorded that university students are now more worried about climate change than has previously ever been recorded. So whether that's coincidence or correlation, we'll, we'll never really know. But there's no debate on this. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you go back through the politics of environmentalism, there's a demand that there mustn't be any debate on this. Two debates, uh, this uh, is an example of you being unscientific and being politically uh, um, naive. Uh, climate change exists and to dispute it is part of the problem. There's one research paper uh, I was uh, reading recently which sums it up, which says, with the autonomy and expertise to push for change, universities are uniquely situated to lead the way in responding to the climate and ecological emergencies and provide a fertile space for discussion and debate. The problem is, is that the, 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 the rules of the debate, the terms of the debate, uh, are, are already set. Uh, it's not that you can actually have a two-way discussion on this. Uh, you just have to look at the uh, nuance in between. Um, the problem of denying it is an example of kind of political uh, delusion. And of course, delusional people shouldn't be in positions of intellectual authority, except maybe in America. Um, one, one research project starts with the premise, what role does self-deception play in how people think about climate change? This is a research paper. So you clearly have a kind of a political ideology which has found its way right into the cent center of the uh, higher educational nar narrative. Um, but it even starts earlier on, but that's part of the problem. The United uh, Nations, UNESCO, uh, teaches sustainable development goals to children as young as four and five, part of the uh, Education for Sustainable Development initiative. Uh, so here's one lesson plan, which is looking at, because they're trying to teach young people about difficult subjects. United Nations has a website called Nursery World, uh, if you care to look it up, uh, how it can influence education. And they're totally looking at difficult issues like Ukraine. So they say the dreadful story of Ukraine is a sensitive issue. So we should encourage the class to reflect and consider the non-human life that would be destroyed as a result of the devastation. Consider the impact the war is having on the planet and reflect upon life without heating by revisiting alternative energy. That's the reflection that you might want to have on the Ukraine, apparently. So what I mean to say is that you have an ideological approach to a, what I think is a highly contestable area of political argument, which is now embedded within education to an extent that we don't even notice it. Uh, we don't talk about it. We've all grown up with it. And in many ways, we welcome it. So as I said, I teach in architecture, and the organization that regulates the profession in architecture, the Architects Registration Board, has begun interfering in not only university education as the validation organization, but actually uh, on the professional training of architects. Uh, so it's not an outside consultancy like those kind of stone walls and, and race trainers that you find. This is the very body that determines uh, the direction of the profession. So we have a national policy now that states that environmental sustainability must be included at every level of undergraduate, postgraduate and professional diploma. And architectural students, I mean this may go beyond architecture but it's very, very uh, deeply embedded. Architectural students must be taught the principles of climate science, uh, whatever that is, 
uh, and they must be taught to advocate for sustainable design. To advocate, you know, that kind of silence is violence. If you don't do it, then you're part of the problem. So we have to advocate. And one of the questions in the blurb for this session was saying, does academic freedom include the freedom to be a political actor? I might turn that around and say, uh, does academic freedom include the freedom not to be a political actor? Because we're all now forced into pushing the climate agenda. If you've not been taught about the climate crisis and you cannot demonstrate you've learned the environmental rules, then you cannot qualify as an architect in this country. Yes, let that sink in for a second. Uh, and the university course will receive a warning. So the imposition has not caused any kickback in universities. As a matter of fact, staff are queuing up to teach it. Uh, and students are crying out if, if they aren't being taught it. We're all climate experts now. Um, Universities UK says, our members are increasingly changing their curricula and educational experiences for students to learn green skills and provide a rounded climate education. So personally, if I see another architecture student who's designing in wood, mud, bamboo, thatch, other barbaric Victorian materials, or if I see another sustainability community workshop or an ecological wildlife habitat, then I'll scream, right? But that's the way things are going. So environmentalism teaches students bugger all about how to build a building in the real world, and we're creating a generation of architects that think they're saving the world and building stupid buildings. Um, so regardless, I would say, of, the, of, as been mentioned a few times, the Higher Education Freedom of Speech Act, the everyday reality is that in most architecture departments, Free expression and freedom to disagree are unacceptable on this particular issue. There are other issues, obviously, but instead of critical inquiry, we have environmental advocacy, and it's kind of, it's kind of burnt into the entire uh, system as the only permissible answer. Try designing something in architecture school and saying it's an unsustainable building. You'd be out the door as soon as you could uh, uh, shout. So staff and students are no longer allowed to make up their own minds if they want to, uh, if they want to get their students to pass. So just in terms of the question on the agenda, impartiality or neutrality, uh, again, I think I'm with Ed on this one, but in terms of the question, I'm not really bothered whether the political establishment or the university has a political agenda, but there's two provisos for that for me. One is that they should be upfront about it. So if I'm applying to them, I know what I'm getting into, therefore it's, it's down to me uh, if I take on board their political agenda. And secondly, that agenda shouldn't interfere with critically engaging with a topic in hand. There has to be a kind of a tolerance of open inquiry and actually having a robust conversation. The problem is that every university teaches this stuff, therefore there's no option for me to choose where I'm going to teach because I have to teach it. Uh, and secondly, the subject by definition doesn't tolerate open debate. You may have heard the environmental mantra, the debate is over. Uh, and for that university, that is a, quite a shocking uh, realisation. So to be a non-political, open-minded educator is becoming almost impossible, uh, I would uh, suggest. I'm afraid that's a very bad part to end, but that's as much as I've got. Thank you very much.